Breakfast Forum. And I'd just like to say that our guest speakers this morning come from two very different types of business situations. Sandra, Nor Sandra Morgan, who is uh, the owner of TheNetworkChefs.com, will be talking about social media and integration. And our other featured guest speaker this morning is Ryan Hollowell from the U.S. Department of Commerce. So we've got some interesting topics for you. Uh, we hope the conversation is lively and that everybody learns a lot. We'd always like to recognize right up front our, our sponsors, our corporate sponsors. And we hope that you visit them and participate in what they do because they help facilitate what happens here. We're very happy to have them on board. Uh, any questions about our sponsors or if anybody would like to become a sponsor of this event, we'd, we'd love to have you on board. Uh, my name is Les Newman. I'm the Managing Director of ICANN New York. And we are uh, a clean tech virtual accelerator operating from our base here in New York. And if any of you have any questions about what we do, who we are, we invite you to give us a call, drop us a line, and um, see how you can be part of our, of our global network. This is some of the things that we do as a group. Our claim to fame is that we have accumulated a fairly broad-based cadre of executives, professionals, academics, technologists from all over the world, and we can offer assistance to you in the uh, parts that generate business, the parts that generate funding, the part that generates commerce and trade globally. That's what this organization is about. We work very closely with economic development organizations uh, to help grow communities. We help reduce costs to economic development agencies by helping them participate in this organization without the need for a physical infrastructure. So again, questions, comments, inquiries, we'd, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, as, as part of our team. We are also part of a, a partnership a partnership here in New York that's sponsored by the uh, New York State uh, Research and Development Authority for the development of clean energy here in New York. We are partnered with the Nanotech Center, which is the College for Nanoscale Science and Engineering in Albany. And together we have a partnership called iClean. iClean is an incubator slash accelerator geared to the commercialization of energy technologies here in New York, and we expand that to our global network of ICANN as well. We are focused on clean, renewable technologies, but we also consider working with a number of other industries such as information technology, business, business development, and trade. So we, we invite your participation. I also wanted to direct you, especially our New York audience, to a symposium that's coming up on December 4th. Uh, the role of intellectual property in entrepreneurship and innovation. This is going to be a live symposium that's being held in cooperation with our, our, our local partner, Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, there will be no webcast of this one. It's only going to be local. We have a wonderful lineup of panelists ready, ready to discuss their viewpoints and yours on intellectual property. As we mentioned last month, um, the discussions on intellectual property are surfacing more and more and more every day, uh, highlighted in no small measure by the uh, lawsuit between Apple and Samsung, which has caused a lot of ripples throughout the entrepreneur community, the innovation community, both here domestically and worldwide. IP is often the foundation on which small, medium, and large enterprises are built. And the, uh, whether knowingly or unknowingly, there are often conflicts in intellectual property, intellectual property development that arise. So knowing, does your company need intellectual property? How do you secure your intellectual property? How do you protect it? How do you license it? 
do you need intellectual property? Um, those are all questions that are going to be discussed at the symposium. Uh, we sure invite your participation in person. Uh, seating is limited. There's only about 130 seats available, so uh, we think you should um, sign on as soon as possible. And the information there is you can call us at the number, or Sarah Bird is our uh, coordinator of all things social media, and she can be reached, Sarah, at ICANNY.net. So if you have any questions or want to participate in that seminar, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. So today we have uh, two, as I mentioned, wonderful guest speakers. Sandra Morgan has, has come to us. Let me just get my notes so I make sure I get her bio correct. Give me one moment. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this, so bear with me. Sandra is the founder and CEO and publisher of Cologne Women, an online magazine and blog, uh, all designed and geared towards supporting her 95,000 subscriber base of women and men 40 plus. Sandra's experience and leadership capabilities for the, for the past 30 years has led her to be a top salesperson, sales manager, and sales trainer for several national and international companies. As a top leader in her field, she moved companies into guiding their training efforts towards the topics of developing a success blueprint, creating a personal brand, evaluating first impressions, the art of selling, and how to convey who you are and what you do. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome in Sandra Morgan. I'd like to welcome in. Good morning. There you go, maybe. Are we there here? Found. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? I can hear her in there, but not out here. <laughs> you have to love technology. No, we're not there yet. Is she there? I am here. She's in there, but she's not in here. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Good morning, Sandra. We're almost there. Uh-oh. I didn't like that noise. That was the Skype said, I don't want to do this noise. She's not on? Her camera's not on. Sandra, turn your oh camera on. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> hmm. Mm. If not, mm -hmm. we can... Let me get my camera on. Okay. If not, we can... I have your slides loaded here, so we can just do this. Say good morning to the audience while you're doing Okay. That. Can you see me now? No. Oh, goodness. I can hear you. I am doing my best. I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. I no, thought it was already on. It's not a problem. The worst comes to worst, I can pull your slides up here and you can talk to the audience. Not an issue. Okay, thank you so much. I apologize. Let's see if we can get this back on here. One day, I promise, one day we're going to get this right. <laughs> That day is obviously not today, but one day. This is probably my fault. I am using a new computer, and I apologize. We think it's a conspiracy. All right, we want to get this computer back on. There we go, maybe. That's this one. Okay, now we got to get it up there. All right, Sandra, while we get this going, you can tell me when you want to advance your slides. I have your first one up now. Being popular okay. can bring business your way. 
So why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and give us a little background on yourself. I've already kind of done your bio, but you can do that in person. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Sandra Morgan. Um, in 2008, I started a company called Kalon Women. Um, it's a magazine for women 40 plus and, and men also. Um, over a period of three years, when I started the magazine, I didn't really have a database of about 200 is all. And so I didn't really know how to market. I didn't have a whole lot of money to do the marketing with. So I jumped on social media. And within three years, we had grown our database to close to 90,000 subscribers. And all of it was done through social media. And then I had people asking me if I could help them do it. And um, so I started doing consulting work. And then it kind of evolved into more of a... Um, I really don't want to do this, so can you do it for me? <laughs> kind of, kind of uh, development. So that's that's how it got started. And um, right now, um, our business is growing and everything is going great. So if you're ready, we'll go ahead and get started. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Well, hopefully by now we can all agree that social media has given consumers the most powerful voice they ever they've ever had. You know, it's still universally accepted that word of mouth has always been considered the very best form of advertising. And since Facebook's like button was introduced in the spring of 2010, users can now show their approval of others' photos, articles, ideas, discoveries, videos, products, and services with just one simple click. In fact, it's estimated that Facebook's like button now gets more than 1 billion clicks per day. And they just hit the 1 billion member mark the other day. So if you're still fighting the Facebook revolution, just remember, it's not going away. And if you don't embrace it, your business just might be. Okay, so we all have an opportunity to reach more people in a significant way through recommendations. And it all starts with improving our communication. And as salespeople or business owners, we can all start by being a more proactive listener and talking less. So the more we listen, the more people talk, and the faster your relationship grows. What you need to start asking yourself when it comes to social media is these four what questions. And if you'll go ahead and do the first one. It's up there. There you go. What do your customers like? Number two. Done. What do they value as relevant or important? What do they value as relevant or important? Number three? Three's up. What content will get them to click your like button? Four's up. And what are some ways you can increase your, your two-way conversations with friends, followers, and fans? Okay. So here are a few things your customers wish you knew about them how they see you and about your relationship. And if you just want to go ahead and click them all less, that's fine. And I'll read them as we, as we go along. Go ahead. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. My life is really stressful. If you can reduce that stress, you become immensely valuable to me. I want to tell you what would make this relationship better for me. Why don't you ever ask me? And that's a big fallacy that we all have as business owners when it comes to social media. We want to tell them everything that we want to tell them, and we really don't listen to what they want us to say to them. Um, I don't understand a lot of the messages you send me. Can you make them clearer? We have to make everything very, very clear when we use social media. I want to trust you, but it's hard for me to trust anyone. And that goes across the board with social media. I spend an awful lot of time being scared to death. And right now in the in the atmosphere that we're at with our economy and everything, this is one fact that everybody is stating. And the wealthier I get, the more I like free stuff. I like to get little goodies no one else is getting. I don't understand how to use your website, but I can't admit that because it would make me feel dumb. If you as a business owner do not know how to navigate your own website, your customers are not going to know how. So make sure that your, your website is easily navigable. I hate salespeople, but I really like to buy things. There's something in my life that I'm afraid of losing. If you can make me feel like you've protected it for me, my gratitude will be intense and eternal. This has to do more with their information. They want, they're fearful of their information getting out there and someone else getting it. I have the attention span of a goldfish. We all know that. 
Go too long without contacting me and I'll simply forget you exist. I believe I deserve much more than I'm getting. I want to tell you everything you need to know in order to sell me, but I'm lazy. Make it easy enough and I will. I don't know what I want most of the time and you need to figure it out for me. And it really is all about me. Okay. So, some of the things on this list might seem cynical, but they're really not. The fact is it doesn't matter what kind of customers you have. I really don't care if your customers are kidney donors or Zen masters or million dollar contributors to your nonprofit organization. Each one of us has some less than lovable characteristics that tend to come to the forefront when we're in the role of customer. So if you knew, if you really knew these 15 things about your customers and acted accordingly, you'd gain their trust and even their love. After all, who doesn't want to be loved and despite all of our flaws and embarrassing insecurities? The better we understand both the noble and not so noble secrets in our customers' consciousness, the better we can serve them. Okay, next slide. Okay, let's not get caught up with buzzwords here. This is very simple. If your clients are important to you, then social media is important to you because those are your clients speaking to you direct. Now, let's, let's repeat that. Those are your clients speaking to you direct on social media. You have access, direct access to the hearts and the minds of the people who use your services in real time, seven days a week. To create real value from this interaction, you need to go beyond the hype of engagement to the simple reality of what social media is about. It's about understanding what your customers find relevant or important. And that what your customers want, you need to listen long before you engage. And then listening grants you insight. Okay, and now, once you've got that, now you're ready to connect. Engagement is only valuable when it is the culmination of listening. Consumers who utilize social media are by and large savvy and they can easily spot shallow marketing techniques. So we need to be really careful. Consequently, businesses more than ever need to be thoughtful in their approach. For me, engagement is not the interaction that happens within superficial discussions on Twitter. It's not about counting fans on Facebook. It's the handling of that information. And it's turning that information into insight. That's engagement. The connections we make. Social, social media is not a fad. So let's not get all caught up in all the hype. If you're new to social media, my advice to you is simple. Forget all about the marketing hype of engagement. Start with observing and listening. Analyze what you hear and use it to gain insight into what your customers really find relevant or important. Yes, engagement is important, but listening is critical. So let's talk about what content will get them to, cl to click on your like button. It's your story, the story. It's never to be underestimated and it's a captivating tale to get your message across. And one, hopefully, that will get people talking about you and your business. It's always about the story. Telling a tale that flows, that connects, that resonates, and that sparks conversation once the story itself has reached its end. This is evident today more than ever with the rise of social media. It's not just about the story anymore. More importantly, it's based upon the, the conversation surrounding the story. It's easy to gauge what gets people talking, sharing, liking, while adding their own thoughts to the original tale, and these types of conversations can offer a lot of value to those participating, especially to the original storyteller, which is you, the business owner. You need to know what they're saying about your story, how they're interacting with your story. Now, keep one thing in mind. We can have all of these social media pieces out there. We can have a great Facebook page and we can be on every kind of social media piece that we, we, have, we, can, we can jump on. But keep one thing in mind. Feedback from our communities is invaluable. And if we're not getting that, we're getting nowhere. So what story are you telling? And does it get them to click on your like button? Does it get people talking? All right, so let's go to the next slide. And we're gonna talk about 
the things that is important that uh, ways that you can increase your two way conversations with friends, followers and fans. And this is very important. I think that at times, most of the time, we're having a one way conversation with our friends, followers and fans. And we think it's things that they we what we think that they want to hear from us, what we think that we want to tell them. So first of all, read your target audience's online content. How many times do you go to their page, go to their business page to see what they're talking about, to see what how they're interacting and what they are interested in doing? Number two, join. Join discussions to learn what's important to them. What are they discussing? Are you jumping in on their discussions? We have a tendency to just want people to come to our page and to join in with our discussions. And so we don't go to other people's pages and join in their discussions. And that's very, very critical. Okay, and the next one is not acknowledge. Always acknowledge every person who reaches out to you. I know that that's difficult when you have, for instance, if you have 100 people joining your Facebook page, it's, it's very overwhelming and it, you think it's very hard to acknowledge them uh, for liking your page. It takes just a few minutes to go onto your wall of your Facebook page and welcome all of your new Facebook fans. Once in a while, just go in, go in and do that. Maybe every 10 days, maybe every 15 days. Go in there and acknowledge all of your new Facebook fans. Facebook fans because then they will appreciate you more. Um, number th the last one definitely is very, very important. Be available. What happens most of the time is we post something on our Facebook pages and then we go on and we do something else and we don't come back until, you know, sometimes a week later. Don't publish your content and then disappear. You have to be available to your audience to answer questions, to, to talk about what's going on. And if we're not available to them, they will definitely get discouraged and they will leave your page and they will unlock your page. So, and then our last uh, part, one thing that we need to understand when it comes to Facebook likes, I know everybody says, well, I want a million likes on my page. That's not the important thing to have. It's better to have a thousand online connections who read, share, and talk about your content with their own audiences than 10,000 connections who disappear after connecting with you the first time. This is something that we want to, to avoid. We want them to stay with us. We want them to be um, active and to participate. And if they're not doing that, your, your Facebook page is not doing what it needs to be doing. So with that being said, that kind of concludes my presentation and we can open up the floor to any questions that anyone might have. Uh, Sandra, thanks very much. Uh, we have a microphone set up here at the front. If anybody has a question, um, just step up to the microphone and, and we'll be happy to do that. Sandra, it seems that the, the mysteries of social media grow every day uh, with the proliferation of the amount of social media networks that are out there. Um, now, you keyed primarily this morning on, on Facebook. Is there, is there any rule that says what social networks we should be involving ourselves in? You know, it, it's geared toward your, toward your business. What I like to tell people is this, um, jumping onto social media, if you're not going to do it full-time basis, you're not going to be really active, I suggest that you really don't jump on social media um, as far as your business is concerned is um, LinkedIn is your social media business and Facebook is of your social media casual attire. On Facebook, you can be more casual, talk about fun things, whereas you're really kind of stuck with attire. So I don't know if that answered your question. Well, it does for me. I mean, we're breaking up a little bit with the communication. We're going to see if we can straighten that out. We have a question from, uh, gee, Al Garlic. Good morning, Al. Hey, Sandra. Can you hear me? I think. I think there's an on button on there. Sandra, can you hear me? Oh. Is the mic on? Technology's great. 
when it works. When it works. Here, use this one. Use this one. I know this one works. Talk, talk into my chest. <laughs> hey, Sandra, it's Al Garlic. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> she can't hear me. She can't hear you? Hi. Sandra, can you hear me? It's Al Garlic. Hear you. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Hey, uh, we've had this conversation in the past, and I thought it might be enlightening um, to talk about the pros and the cons of the systems and software that will automate your posts across many social media platforms, and because that's all changed in the last few months. Can you really do that? What? 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 I'd be interested in the answer. Well, there's. You. Uh, well, we we had it on and off. Maybe the battery's dead. Could you hear the question? Uh oh. Now we lost Sandra. <laughs> hear me? Hello. Yeah, we're here. Sandra, could you hear the question? Oh, boy. Can you hear the question? I mean, um, you're breaking up here. Let's start. Did you hear the question clearly? Yes, I did. I heard the OK, and then I'll just turn it over to you. And OK. So, so there are a lot of programs here um, that you to schedule your and week. And don't we love Skype? Everybody, don't we love Skype? Hear me. You hear me? No, barely. Uh, we're having an issue with Skype this morning. I think uh, wherever in the world you are, it's, it's not the greatest, but um, uh -huh. try it again. Are you loud? Well, that noise says Skype has decided we're not worthy. Well, you there, Sandra? Yes, I am here. Can you? It's breaking up pretty severely. We're going to try and call you back. Okay. That's the noise we wait for with great anticipation. One day, I promise you, one day we're going to get this all right. Just doesn't appear today is that day. Okay, is that better? Yes. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Awesome. Okay, to answer your question, um, there's a lot of programs out there that were created to help with the ease of posting um, to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn. The problem is, is that all of Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter have all become very smart when it comes to that. And what they're real, what they were realizing is that there was not actually a physical person logging into their LinkedIn account, logging into their Facebook account and Twitter account, and that these posts were coming from third-party um, um, applications. So what has happened? Let's take Facebook for instance. If you use Hootsuite for example, as one of the programs to post, to automatically post your Facebook post or your Twitter post, Facebook is taking those out of the feed. They're not allowing those to go into the main feed where all of your connections can see them. The reason being, and rightly so, is they want a physical person going in there and posting these because if they don't, if they don't watch it, it's going to be a bunch of bots out there just posting things and not an actual human being um, interacting with their Facebook page, their, their connections. And that's what um, um, Facebook and now Twitter, Twitter has stopped allowing third-party applications to post to um, take their Twitter feeds and post them to the other sites. So we have to be really careful if we're still using these products and understand that your feeds are not being seen on Facebook, and Twitter has stopped allowing those. So um, I hope that answers your question. Sandra, another question we had come up is the uh, use of free public relations sites. Um, there's always an issue that if you create a press release and you send it through a quote-unquote free PR site, that it's not being distributed. Are there any tricks to getting noticed or... Is, is the free method not the way to go? 
you know, the, the free method is, is okay. I mean, it's going to get out there. Um, your, your message will get out there. It's not going to get picked up by the people that you really wanted to get picked up. Um, let's face it that, you know, most companies want you to pay their fee. They want you to pay their fee to send out a press release. And there are some sites out there that aren't so expensive and they do get you out there. The one thing I can tell people too is when you're putting out a press release, even a free one, contact your local newspapers, contact your local business journals and things like that. Contact them direct with your press release. Don't wait for it, them to try and pick it up through the um, through the free press release because nine times out of ten it's not going to it's just not going to happen. Plus, you need to also be taking your press release and putting it out there across all of your social media. It needs to go out in your newsletter. It needs to go on your blog. It needs to go everywhere. And so. We can't put a, a press release out on the free press release and expect it to do all the work by itself. Well, that was kind of my next question. What is press release etiquette when it comes to social media and your clients? You, uh, when it comes to press releases, it's just like a press release works. You can put on to Facebook for immediate release. I mean, you can put that on there and shout to the rooftops as to what's going on with your company. So it, it works just like you would be sending out a press release on social media. These are things that you want your clients to know. So by all means, um, go out there and shout it to the mountaintops. Sandra, the last question I have, you know, we, we have this uh, debate internally all the time. How much contact with a client or a prospect is too much? How many times, like this event, we send out three emails notifying people of, of this event. Is there a right number? Is there a wrong number? How often do you inundate people on when they get say, that's enough? Well, that's, that's a tricky one. <laughs> that's a tricky one because um, what I normally tell people is you have to blog, number one, no less than three times a week. No less than three times a week. Um, go out and post it onto your social media accounts no less than three times a week. Um, those, are, those are key components. Um, the reason I say three times a week for your blog, um, Google will start to pick you up for, for um, three times a week, minimum of three times a week posting to your, to your website. Uh, Google loves that. Um, any, and as far as anything more than that, you know, I have clients, I have people that I'm connected with on Facebook and on Twitter and stuff, and, and they are just constantly bombarding. They go on and they post 20 things at one time. I will be honest with you, I, I disconnect with those people because it's very annoying, it's very irritating. So I would suggest that three times a week is probably the best thing. If you want to once a day, that's fine. But I would say, you know, posting you know, 10 to 15 things every single day on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. If you're staying in connection with your, with, for instance, if you take your post, your blog post, and you put it on your, your LinkedIn feed or you put it on your LinkedIn group, that's going to reach your connections because LinkedIn will send out your information. So three times a week, we seem um, to see that that is really benefiting our clients at least a minimum of times a week. Great. And if anybody has any further questions for Sandra, uh, we've posted here on the screen your contact information, and I assume you accept phone calls and emails and Absolutely. tweets and friends and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Just look us up. Great. Sandra, thanks so much for your uh, presentation this morning. Thanks for having me, Les. Have a good day. You too. We'll chat soon. Bye-bye. Well, social media takes a very special place around here. Is Ryan online? Do we know? He is. Okay. Let's, let's continue on and kind of change, change directions a little bit. Uh, Ryan works for the U.S. Department of Commerce, and I guess the budget cuts at the Department of Commerce are hitting there as well, so we don't have availability of Skype. But, Ryan, are you online? Yep, yep. I am here. I am here. Oh, you sound like you're back in the Philippines. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, let, me, let me try that. Let me change a little bit. All right. And then while you're doing that, let me just kind of read Ryan's bio and, and we'll get him up to speed. 
Ryan is a, uh, an international trade specialist representing, representing the U.S. Department of Commerce in the New York U.S. Export Assistance Center in Manhattan, where he has served for over three years. Ryan's industry focus covers renewable energy, oil and gas, financial services, automotive, aerospace, defense, as well as safety and security. During this time, Ryan has assisted in over $1.6 billion in energy exports for his clients. Before joining the U.S. Department of Commerce, Ryan spent two years on Capitol Hill working for a 12-term congressman and an additional two years with a lobbying firm where he assisted in the startup of their climate change lobbying practice. Um, I'm not going to go into the rest of your bio, my friend, but um, why, don't you, why don't you say good morning to everyone and, and kind of bring everybody up to speed, and I've got your presentation loaded here, so let me know when you want to start that. Great. Thanks so much, Les. Um, and, and to give you all a little bit of additional background here on what we do at the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce uh, and how we work, it is essentially we have 100 offices throughout the United States and 130 overseas offices. So essentially we're the uh, U.S. Embassy or Consulate. We have someone that's on the ground internationally that is equipped to help uh, U.S. companies enter that market. Uh, and and that, comes, that, that type of assistance comes into locating the distributor, locating the agent, a joint venture partner, or even uh, to advocate on behalf of a company as they bid on the uh, city government tender overseas. In addition to that, we, get, we also work with other uh, agencies of the government, such as the Small Business Administration, Export Import Bank, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and uh, as well as the Multilateral Development Bank, so I'll touch upon towards the end of my presentation, all in an effort to uh, basically uh, I guess they kind of connect the dots for U.S. companies. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and so as a result of that, uh, uh, here in New York, we've really been able to grow the energy practice and, and grow the uh, exports that are coming from the clean tech sector. As, as both Les and I have talked, with, uh, talked about for quite some time now, um, there really is a great clean tech sector developing here on the East Coast. And I think it's uh, unappreciated and, and underrecognized. Uh, so, so with that, what, what the goal that I wanted to talk to you all uh, about today was about some of the best uh, prospect markets outside of the usual BRIC countries that everyone thinks of. Uh, we always have clients that are coming to us uh, that are saying, um, I, I would like to go to Brazil, I would like to go to China, or I would like to go to India. However, that's, that's not the best place to start it. And so here are some, uh, so, so we'll talk about it in a second, uh, a few of the markets that are off the beaten path a little bit um, that I think are a better place, uh, and, and also some of the ones that have some great opportunities that uh, you won't find the type of competition that you will find in India or China or even in South Africa. Um, and so, so Les, uh, if it's okay, we're going to start with a presentation here. Um, and uh, you know, on slide two are just a few of the, the various clients that I work with. Um, some are, uh, you know, major wind developers, some are major solar developers, um, as well as uh, a small company here that has a, 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 a light pole that's wind and solar powered, and uh, another company that does a tidal power. So, you know, it's not just limited to the usual solar uh, and wind that everyone picks up. It's also down to the, the, the products that are available as well. I've got your markets um, overview slide up here, uh, Roy. Yeah, I've got your markets overview slide up, so when you want me to advance, just give me the high sign. Oh. Okay, so, so we'll move on to uh, slide three, and, and, and unless I had a hard time sharing you on that response. Canada. Um, I'll continue on. Uh, so the rest of slide, slide three is it, more about the markets overview. Um, and, and, and what we'll talk about here uh, are really from the, the increasing opportunities uh, on every continent that are out there. Um, and really the best industries are going to drive by the market. 
Uh, later on, we'll talk about solar, uh, wind, biomass based energy, um, hydro, green building, and net zero building. Uh, so, so, so we'll move on to a, a slide for the, the first part we'll talk about is, is, is close to home, um, is, is, is Canada. And, and not everyone always thinks about that as a, a place that has a, a great solar market. Um, but there really is uh, a lot of good opportunities for U.S. companies um, under both NAFTA as, as well as with regards to some of the feeding tariffs that they do have available. Um, so, so starting on, on slide five here is it is really within Canada that a lot of the power generation um, is currently based on coal, but it's starting to be um, changed with uh, natural gas, renewable energy, um, as well as potentially biomass as well. Um, uh, there's a lot of incentives, uh, particularly within the Ontario and Quebec, um, for developing these programs. Um, there are a number of feeding tariffs that are available with the U.S. companies. However, one issue that some U.S. companies are running into is uh, the local content requirements that are starting to be implemented uh, within Ontario specifically. Um, so so that, that requires a certain percentage of a project to have uh, content that, that's uh, manufactured in Canada as a way of, um, you know, it's a protection that's measured, but a lot of it is actually protecting against uh, uh, some of the Chinese imports that are saturating the market and, and ruining some of the local production. Um, this is also happening within uh, 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 was in India, uh, and, and yeah, also this, this week the, the U.S. government will be uh, giving a final ruling on the, uh, the new tariff increases, which are expected to be around 250 percent for the majority of uh, China's solar panel manufacturers. So we move on to uh, slide six here uh, to discuss uh, some of the other best prospects outside of just solar. Um, if you want to win. Um, and this is really, uh, a lot of it is going to be more in the offshore capacity, as well as some of the wind farms as well. Um, uh, currently, not many folks would think, uh, but Canada ranks uh, ninth in installed capacity uh, of, of wind projects uh, worldwide. Uh, and and uh, it's expected to reach about 94.2 gigawatts uh, over the next five years, uh, which is a staggering number. Uh, and like I also said, it, it, it biomass is, is, is also critical in, in this is they have, uh, as it, there's some opportunities there where they can, where you can use a biomass byproduct to, uh, to replace coal in a lot of the uh, factories um, that are producing energy you know, uh, within the market. So maybe going to slide seven is uh, kind of on the other side of the pond and, and mentioning, uh, especially for the opportunities that are in Germany and Denmark. Uh, with, with, with Germany on slide eight, uh, uh, the, the goal is to have 20% uh, uh, of the renewable energy um, that accounts for, the, for their production uh, by 2020. Um, of that 28%, 25% uh, is expected to be wind. Um, solar is expected to be about 7%. Um, and then also the statistics there the statistic for bioenergy. And, with Germany, though, it is interesting in that a lot of it is going to be under the distributed side. So a lot of this is more of a rooftop solar, uh, the rooftop wind. So, so it, it's not the usual large uh, uh, solar field or wind farms that, that folks will think of, but this is more on the distributed, so it's more distributed on the grid. And then with regards to uh, Germany continuing, uh, there's also some hydro opportunities. And, and of course, geothermal. Uh, geothermal is, is a large opportunity within the market. And one of the events that uh, we are involved with there, I, I'll try to touch upon these as, as we move along, uh, is we're actually, you know, uh, later in November, is, is running a, a combined trade mission to, to Germany uh, for the renewable energy sector that it will include both venture capital and the renewable energy clean technology companies. Uh, and this will give uh, companies a unique opportunity to not only find partners within the market, but also to liaise with some of the VC and private equity companies that will be attending. Um, as, as of course, as you all know, uh, everyone is always interested in, in how to obtain uh, more funding and financing. So moving on to slide 10, I think, in my opinion, one of the most fascinating markets for 
for, for companies in any way. And it's relatively easy, it would be, would be Denmark. Uh, by, by, by 2035, 100% of the electricity and heat is going to be from renewable sources. Um, and by 2050, 100% uh, of the entire energy supply is, is going to be from renewable sources. And that includes uh, industry and transportation. Um, and that's also something that's important to touch upon with, uh, with regards to Germany as well, is there's a large push for electric vehicles. Uh, but not just electric vehicles, but you also have the battery storage capacity. You also have the electrical vehicle stuff charging stations. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities aside from some of those that are discussed in the clean tech sector um, in, in both of these markets um, as a way to, to get involved. Um, so we, we would, with regards to Denmark, most of the wind will come uh, offshore. Um, biomass, uh, biofuels uh, are, are a big driver of the electricity market. Um, and then there's also a talk of wave energy, but that, that's more of a longer term vision. Uh, as, 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 as fairly limited in the technology is in the uh, infancy stage. But the important thing to also remember is the the opportunities for smart grid technologies, smart grid applications, even software that can help predict uh, grid loading as well. Uh, because you know, if you're bringing up all these uh, um, uh, different types of electricity, and you need to have the technology uh, in order to to load properly, load the grid. And, and, and what we'll do is, is move on to the next. Um, the next uh, slide on slide 14 is talk regarding a little bit about the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, we just ran a renewable energy trade mission, clean tech trade mission, um, to those two markets uh, back in September 17th to the 21st. Uh, we brought nine companies that were interested, and these really ranged from, uh, you, you could say, the, the tidal ocean technology to biomass biofuel to solar and wind, to smart grid, to, to also the software that, that helps uh, the solar and wind companies kind of predict um, their future forecasting on, uh, on what they can expect and, 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 and give them an opportunity to, to work with some of these spot markets, uh, to work with some of the local companies, and to work with some of the local utilities. So on slide 15, uh, we'll talk briefly about the Philippines as an opportunity for U.S. companies. Uh, the goal in the Philippines is uh, to have 60% of uh, all the energy come from renewables by 2017. It seems like a, a very lofty goal. However, we're currently about, I want to say about 40 to 45 percent of their electricity already comes from renewable resources. And the reason for this is because the, the high cost of electricity it's actually uh, relatively competitive to to produce uh, renewables at a price that is, that is comparable to what you can expect to pay for oil or gas. Because what they actually do is they don't they don't offer the large subsidies to oil and gas uh, uh, the importation or production um, in country. Uh, so 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 it makes renewables uh, a realistic uh, uh, a goal uh, by 2017. Uh, and so, uh, everyone knows the Philippines for the large geothermal capacity. Um, obviously, with being a, a, a country of maybe what, seven or nine thousand islands, depending on the tides, um, you, you, have a, you obviously have a lot of uh, wind, um, hydropower, and ocean, both ocean thermal and ocean tidal. But I think more importantly here for, for a lot of the companies, what they don't expect is the need for more of a distributive as well, similar to what we, we experienced in Germany and, uh, uh, as well. Uh, but with regards to the Philippines, you have all those islands that aren't necessarily connected to the grid, so they're really looking for solutions uh, that can be more grid-free and can be more um, on the distributive scale uh, and self-sustaining. Uh, so, so for any of you that might have technology related to that, I think it's a great opportunity um, for, for, for U.S. companies to get involved in that market. It's very pro-U.S. business. Uh, they have some great incentives uh, between tax holidays um, and uh, tax and duty for importation. And more importantly, um, they have a stable government that, that just released uh, uh, a, a feed-in tariff 
um, that they have been expected to be in place for at least the next three or four years. So it's a good opportunity to get involved within the market. Um, uh, for, for a U.S. company that to become a part of the Asian market without having to really go through a lot of the hurdles that you could find with some of the others. So we're going to uh, the next market would be Thailand, where they have a, a, an objective for 25% of total energy by 2022. A lot of this so far has been uh, generated by the biomass and biogas. Uh, there's about 1,200 uh, megawatts of wind and solar available to them, but a lot of this is, is more outside of Bangkok in the northeast and the northwest region. And while most of the country is, is well connected to the grid, the issue that they're running into now is actually in the northeast and northwest regions. Uh, they don't have the grid connectivity there to, to bear the load of this 1,200 megawatts. So this is where more also uh, soil in the Philippines, you have the distributive of opportunities. And, and one thing with both power and the Philippines uh, that, that, that could be of interest to, to some of these, to, to some companies, um, is, is they, on the various islands, they have a number of resorts, they have a number of high-end resorts. And what, what you can do uh, as a result is you can get into the greening of, their, of these resorts. So if you have various technology that can be, you know, for green building, uh, for even um, uh, more of the off-grid solutions, uh, these could be great opportunities for, for U.S. companies to get involved and to sell their, companies, to sell their products or services uh, to, to the market. Uh, so, so moving on um, uh, to slide 17 is, you know, everyone always, also, always has to become uh, or, or talk to us about the opportunities in Brazil. And while, yes, uh, for more products and services alone, it is a, a wonderful, wonderful market, but the tariffs and the duties that U.S. companies uh, and the difficulties that they can run into uh, sometimes outweigh the benefits that you'll find within the market. Uh, right now, there's obviously a large push uh, within Brazil for the uh, upcoming Olympics and uh, and World Cup games two years prior, uh, where they have a goal of becoming the first essentially green games. So if you're interested in that market in Brazil, I certainly don't want to ignore it or discourage you, but now is the time to get involved with that market uh, because there will be some restrictions, some local content requirements, and there will also be some uh, restrictions in terms of the type of partners you can have uh, and employees that you can uh, work with. Um, but, but, but with regards to Chile, uh, there's uh, a lot of also uh, great opportunities where um, you know, they, they recently, uh, you know, the original goal was 10% of the renewables uh, by 2024, um, but they've actually just recently announced, uh, I want to say maybe uh, earlier this year, uh, to have about 20% by 2020. And this is really going to come from a number of uh, different opportunities from hydro, to thermal, to wind generation, um, a lot of it is, will, will be on the, uh, uh, the, the scale from 0.3 megawatts to 10 megawatts, um, so similar to like the small project, um, as well as uh, uh, solar. Uh, and the solar will be more on the utility scale, but it's important to note that it's also for water heat, it's for solar thermal technologies as well. Now, in my opinion, some of the most uh, uh, intriguing opportunities probably come from the, Af the, the African market. Um, obviously, everyone knows about South Africa as, as an opportunity, but, but similar to what you'll find, what was mentioned here about India, about Brazil, and, and also about Canada. In, in South Africa, um, it, it's, it's fairly soon that they'll, they'll be doing uh, also local content requirements uh, for imported products and projects that are going to be implemented. Um, so a lot of companies are, are keen on, on maybe uh, uh, finding a local manufacturer. Um, then, then you know you need to get involved sooner rather than later in that market. But you know with the unprecedented potential, you have unprecedented obstacles. You have large fossil fuel subsidies within the market of Africa. You have high cost of uh, renewable energy plants. You have a, a poor and great connectivity with low low load factors. Uh, and and uh, you, you, of course, have the, the inadequate regulatory and government uh, environment where you don't necessarily have the stability that's going to come into place with uh, a 20-year PPA. But, but what could be important there uh, for those that have products is that if, 
the ever growing consumer market. So if you have a clean tech product, say it's a solar powered flashlight or a solar powered lantern, um, you have a, 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 a growing consumer market uh, with, a, with a growing uh, middle class. Uh, so so and people are, are, are there and they are, are ready to spend money for high quality products as opposed to just what, find the, the lowest cost option. And so, so aside from South Africa, uh, moving on to the next slide, is uh, a market like Kenya. Um, only 23% of the population has access to electricity. So as a result, uh, you have groups such as uh, the ISD um, uh, that has a, a large focus on uh, lighting Africa and they actually have offices in Kenya. Uh, so there, it, the key is to have to distribute it. You have the opportunities more on the home level or the village level to help bring electricity to those markets. Uh, the, the total investment in the, the renewable energy market is, in, in Kenya is 1.4 billion. This is between um, the government, the U.S. government, as well as uh, groups like the Africa Development Bank that we'll talk about uh, briefly. Uh, but you also have issues such as water and wastewater. Um, there's 2.5 billion that have invested in, uh, or we will be invested in that over the next five to ten years. Um, you have new feeding tariffs to increase these incentives. Um, as well as uh, you, you have opportunities in, in wind, solar, biomass, um, geothermal waste energy, and hydro. So the, a lot of these opportunities are there in, in a great market like Kenya, where you'll probably find a little less competition than you will uh, in, in a market like South Africa that, that's slowly becoming saturated. And so moving on uh, to the final. Uh, the final, the final kind of uh, slide on uh, slide 20. The one thing I like to bring in uh, to all of this um, are kind of the various financing tools uh, that are available to U.S. companies. That uh, whether you're developing a project or whether you're selling a product, um, there, there, there are various financing tools for these uh, for U.S. companies that are, are, are underutilized, in our opinion. Uh, the Overseas Bank Investment Corporation, OPIC. It, it actually is an organization that's done for lending. Um, it, 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 where there is no U.S. Uh, context uh, requirements like there is with Exit Bank. By the way, with OPIC, uh, you must have 25% U.S. equity in the project. Uh, in, in addition to kind of the, the debt financing that they do, uh, they also uh, offer insurance um, that will cover everything from political risk insurance to uh, the, the risk that is, you know, it comes into play with potential change in feeding tariffs uh, and the results of the regime change uh, uh, where, where they, they're no longer keen on, on keeping the feeding tariffs and they want to make the, the market more, more natural. Uh, the OPIC actually does the lending uh, and the interesting part with OPIC is that they do not work essentially in developed markets. So basically you won't find OPIC in Canada, Western Europe or Australia. Rather they're very active in India, they're very active in Africa, Eastern Europe. Uh, so, so basically wherever, wherever is, there is not a developed market though, but they probably have some form of presence there in, in terms of lending opportunities and risk and insurance opportunities. Next up is uh, the Export Import Bank of the United States. Uh, so that they can uh, help uh, give government guarantees on uh, potential uh, uh, sales. Uh, where, where a U.S. company, uh, if you're selling a product with only 51% U.S. content, um, you can bring a financing opportunity to your buyer. When, so, so they'll help finance the buyer of a U.S. product, uh, that is at least for 21% U.S. content, which is always important. And, as, you, as you work with uh, folks overseas, if you have the ability to come to them with financing, uh, in addition to just the product and the great offer, offerings that you have, uh, it also make you real make up on the competition. In addition to that, though, they also give uh, export credit insurance, so you can even take out insurance on non-payment from a buyer. Uh, so there's that opportunity as well. Um, the next one down is the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, USTDA. From there, they actually have U.S. grants. Excuse me, uh, U.S. grants where. Uh, they can help fund uh, feasibility studies. For instance, I had a client that was working on a solar project in India, 
and we worked with him and we worked with USTDA to get them about $900,000 to develop a solar PV project within the market. And this is money that is, does not have to be repaid. Uh, it is, it is a, a straight grant that uh, uh, the only caveat there is that uh, you must hire a U.S. contractor to implement the feasibility study. And they have a list of ones that they work with and they can walk you through that project. Uh, a lot of folks don't know about the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, especially when thinking of uh, renewables, you don't think about the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but they also uh, work a lot with the biomass industry. Uh, and, and as a result, with USDA, uh, they, they will help uh, with funding of, uh, of various purchases of your byproducts. Um, you know, it's similar to what you'll find from a group like Expen Bank. Uh, one group for, uh, that I always recommend folks to look up, um, in addition to the Millennium Challenge Corporation, is the U.S. Agency for International Development. They're doing a lot of great work with clean tech. They have a lot of great initiatives for grants and a lot of uh, great initiatives to help U.S. companies enter the market um, in a lot of these developing economies with clean tech products uh, that will give them uh, a leg up on the competition and uh, we'll bring them kind of a funding and a financing option uh, with that. And then, of course, uh, we have the multilateral development banks. Uh, you, some are much quicker and much better to work with than others. Uh, we do a lot of bank, or a lot of work, I should say, with the African Development Bank, Asia Development Bank, um, EBRD, uh, and we also have a liaison uh, to the uh, World Bank. So, so essentially, we, we also work with U.S. companies to help them gain access to these various multilateral development banks, to even bid on projects or opportunities within the bank, um, to also help gain access to some of the financing and funding opportunities for projects or for their products um, in these opportunities, or in these markets, I should say. Um, and so as a result, I just, I, I just wanted to kind of give you all uh, uh, an opportunity to, to, to learn and see a little bit more about some markets that were off the beaten path a little bit, uh, that probably are normally uh, uh, on the forefront of, of everyone's radar. As we touched on good questions about the usuals of uh, the BRICS, um, and so I wanted to go through uh, some of those other opportunities that are available to U.S. companies. Uh, there certainly is a growing desire and a growing need for U.S. clean tech products because they have the uh, they, they have the quality that, that uh, companies are looking for. Uh, it certainly is a competitive market, uh, which is where co going after uh, defeating tariff opportunities certainly play a major role. Uh, and so as a result, uh, on, the, on the following and, and final slide, uh, I wanted to give you all my contact information. Uh, I would I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have now or, or even offline. Uh, and, and, and if you'd like uh, to, to kind of work with us a little bit to help uh, develop your markets overseas, uh, I'd be happy to do so, um, as well as bringing maybe someone that's local to you that can really sit down with you um, and to work with you to help uh, come up with a good strategy for developing, an for developing your, market, your marketing um, opportunities internationally. Which is, that's really where we come into play with all this, is, is helping identify those best market prospects uh, for a U.S. company and helping to, to, to implement that strategy on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and like I said, we can help companies find agents, distributors, join venture partners, and even advocate um, on your behalf, as well as connect some of the dots here with regards to some of the funding and financing opportunities that are available um, via the U.S. government to multilateral development banks. I want to thank you, uh, and first I also apologize for the uh, uh, technical malfunctions on my end, uh, as uh, there are certainly some restrictions on Skype and everything that are uh, able to be installed on our U.S. Computer, government computers, uh, but I, I apologize for that, and then, like I said, please uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm happy to work with you uh, and, and, and just really address any questions that you have. Um, as I know, a lot of you have probably also been contacted by uh, uh, folks from overseas that may find you on the internet. We can also help with vetting those folks, making sure they're not only the list they're not supposed to be on under FCPA. 
uh, and we can really just, just kind of be a resource uh, for, for, for you all um, to, to developing your national business strategy. Uh, so thank you again. Um, thank you to Les uh, for the opportunity. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Great presentation, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thanks, um, any questions from the audience right now? Well, you know, one of the questions that I have, Ryan, you know that we, we kind of foster uh, the, 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 the concepts of, of international trade. Do you have to be a big company to get involved, or what are the opportunities for smaller emerging technologies? Certainly, and, and, and you definitely do not have to be a large company. Um, our, our focus is actually working with the small, medium-sized businesses that are out there. Uh, so, so as much as you know, I've worked with a few uh, companies uh, locally here that have been a part of various incubators here in Manhattan uh, to the point where we've helped them graduate from the incubator into their own office space um, here in the Manhattan. And, and in that type of work is where they, when they started as maybe a two, three, three person company sitting around the same desk as an incubator, as an incubator um, to, to find the right applications and opportunities for their technology uh, and then identifying the best markets. Uh, in this case, it was Western Europe. Uh, it's more of an analytical uh, product. And, and, and then uh, helping them locate distributors uh, or, or agents that were, that were willing to represent them to the point that we've now um, helped, helped them just recently close uh, about a $12 million project in South Africa, in addition to a number of projects, or a number of, I shouldn't say sure projects, but a number of um, distributors and agents um, throughout Western Europe. Uh, and the next step for them is uh, in South Asia. Well, those are certainly the places to be, and there are certainly opportunities all over the world that are emerging. What do you see on the reverse side? Um, Technologies being developed in other countries looking to commercialize or partner with companies here in the United States. What are the opportunities you see? Um, you know, I, I, think, uh, I think there are a lot of great opportunities for those that are kind of looking to partner with um, U.S. companies uh, to, to finalize their, or to say, commercialize their, their, their uh, technology here in the U.S. Um, there's specifically, I know there are some folks here in New York that, you know, they've done a demonstration project here because we'll put them on the, uh, on the spotlight for, for the opportunities that are available to them. Um, you know, for, for a lot of what, what's a little frustrating, I'm sure, for, for many of the companies that are uh, here um, and that are part of your various uh, incubators and are on the line today, um, are, are some of the, uh, I guess you could say the lackadaisical stance by, uh, uh, the U.S. government to, to move forward uh, with, um, you know, helping companies not only commercialize here, uh, we, which we've done a good job of thus far, um, but, but enter into this U.S. market and, and provide the right kind of incentives. Uh, the interesting part, uh, a little off the record, will be to see what happens over this next election, um, and uh, it will certainly dictate the, the type of, uh, uh, I guess you could, uh, the type of attention that renewables and clean technologies will get. Um, but, but there certainly are opportunities. Uh, you know, what I've actually done with a number of companies is, is to help them partner with, with folks overseas to finalize that commercialization um, in, in overseas markets as well, where, where you know, you'll probably have to do some form of a testing anyway, so we can help partner with universities. We can help partner with uh, uh, larger larger companies uh, that maybe want to do test projects. Um, so there are those opportunities available as well. Ryan, for our international uh, viewers, would they contact you through their local consulates or country consulates? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, so for those internationally, um, certainly. And you know, we have actually what's known as a, a Select USA program. Uh, and under the Select USA program is where we kind of help uh, introduce folks to potential partners here, uh, as well as the various states to kind of walk them through the incentive process and, and uh, to basically learn about what incentives are out there for a U.S. company or for a foreign company looking to enter into the U.S. market. 
uh, whether it's various tax holidays, um, what is the say about the utility bills, uh, a number of different uh, avenues that we can go. Down to we help folks uh, uh, with the visa issues. Uh, that they sometimes come into play with opening up uh, uh, an office here in the U.S. and bringing technology in. Great. Ryan, great presentation. I thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'll give you a buzz next week, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks a million. Sounds good. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Well, you know, we learned a lot this morning. Uh, we've learned that there are lots of opportunities, both domestically internationally, through the web, through social media. How do we take advantage of these opportunities? Uh, that uh, becomes the, the overriding question, doesn't it? Um, anybody have anything they'd like to add, contribute? We have a quiet audience this morning. Well, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you all the people online. I appreciate your attending as well. We have a, a wonderful presentation lined up for next month, so we'll be sending out no more than three per week, uh, emails, and, and we will catch you all then. Thank you very much and have a productive day. Take care.